Good afternoon. Welcome to the AgriAbility webinar series. My name is Paul Jones, and I am the manager of the National AgriAbility Project, which is housed at Purdue University. Today's topic is lighting for health and safety in agricultural settings, and our presenter today is Rob Stuthridge. He is the project ergonomist for the National AgriAbility Project. Before we get started with the actual content of the webinar, I'd like to just go over a few basic instructions. You will need speakers or headphones to hear the presentation, as we are not using a phone connection today. You might like to uh, check your connection speed under the meeting menu at the top left of your screen under the Manage My Settings uh, choice there. Dial-up is not recommended for this webinar. If you have questions during the webinar about the content, please make sure you type those into the chat window on the left side of your screen and hit the return icon. Also, during the question and answer period at the end of the uh, presentation, if you have a webcam and or microphone, you can click the raise hand icon, which is at the top of your screen, and we will activate your microphone so that you can ask your question verbally. We will have four quick poll questions at the end of the session, so please stick around and give us some feedback about the presentation. The session is being recorded and will be archived on our website, www.agrability.org slash online training slash archived along with the PowerPoint presentation. If you have any problems in regard to technical aspects of the program, please use the chat window if you're able to. Again, just type your uh, issue into the chat window and hit the return icon. If that is not functional for you, please send an email to agribility at agribility.org, and we will plan to put that email address up on the uh, chat window so you can refer to it that way. A few issues that we've had in the past, if we are disconnected with our presenter, please just hang on and we will reconnect as quickly as possible. If you are disconnected as a participant, uh, please just log in again. That's the best solution to that issue. For those that are not familiar with AgriAbility, we are sponsored by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and the focus of the program is to assist farmers, ranchers, and other agricultural workers with disabilities. Every AgriAbility project is a partnership between a land-grant university and at least one disability services organization. Currently, there are 23 state AgriAbility projects that cover 25 states, and uh, there is one national AgriAbility project, which I indicated is led by Purdue's Breaking New Ground Resource Center. Partners on our national AgriAbility project include Goodwill of the Finger Lakes, the Arthritis Foundation Heartland Region, University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign and Colorado State University. And again, please feel free to find out more about AgriAbility at www.agribility.org. At this point, I'm going to turn things over to our presenter, Rob Stuthridge, for the body of the presentation, and I will return at the end for the poll questions and the question and answer period. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Hi, everybody. I'm Rob Stuthridge. And, um, uh, I'm going to get through quite a few uh, pieces of information today. Um, I think this is an important topic. It's uh, something that um, we haven't covered as a technical uh, subject before, although uh, I did make a presentation at the National uh, Training Workshop on this, and I've expanded on some of the information for this, so if you did attend that, there is some new information here as well. I'm quickly going to go through the importance of, of lighting, uh, how we uh, measure light, particularly the way we refer to light uh, when, we're making, when we're taking measurements. Uh, spend some time on lighting problems, some of the issues of visual performance that affect visual performance, uh, a little bit about visual disorders, and uh, how lighting is uh, significantly uh, a factor in, in uh, whether ta tasks are visual, um, so the visual nature of task demands, and then we're going to look at the types of lighting and some of the pros and cons of those. And um, towards the end, we're going to uh, mention a little bit about standards and guidelines. Uh, right at the back, um, because I don't want to go through that in detail, I've, I've 
produce a list of references and resources uh, to which I will have referred or, or uh, covered during the presentation proper. Okay, so why is it important? Well, the first thing is that we actually receive most of our information through site. 85% of, of our information on the world around us uh, it comes through this sense. And light, of course, is essential to site. The amount of light that's provided for particular tasks influences our posture. We get closer to tasks if we can't see them very well. So there is an influence on head, neck, and trunk posture. And many will have encountered situations where people complain of eye fatigue or a visual fatigue and eye strain. Lighting is critical to safety. Uh, it allows us to define uh, the locations of machinery or moving objects. And in fact, one study in 97 uh, found that 40% of falls in a, a geriatric care hospital were due to poor lighting. And lighting, of course, also affects our mood, the way we're feeling on a day-to-day -day basis and throughout the day as well. What is light? Well, light is essentially something we can define by it being the visible part of um, the electromagnetic spectrum. Light is radiant energy that's capable of, of exciting the retina and producing a visual sensation. And essentially, the human eye, in a simple sense, has two sets of receptors. Cones, which are most sensitive to wavelengths around 550 nanometers. And these are the parts of the eye that are most active in bright light. They give us our detail and our color recognition. Also within the eye are the rods, and these tend to be uh, scattered out more towards uh, the kind of periphery of the eye. They're sensitive to a different wavelength, the blue-green wavelength, and they become dominant receptors in dim light. They're also extremely important to our peripheral vision. Um, it follows on from this that if we use targets that have blue-green coloring, especially illuminated targets, uh, it does tend to be more detectable at night because it feeds into uh, the strong area of, of cones. Well, some of the terms, I'm not going to go through all of these. This is up there for you to uh, take a look at later. But the, the issues, the areas that I'm going to be referring to as I go through this presentation include illuminance, which is a uh, silly thought of. We'll often think of that as actually the brightness of light. But really what it is, it's the quantity of light energy that falls on a surface. And we actually uh, measure that in, in units called lux. Luminance is the amount of light energy that's reflected back from a surface, and that's in candelas per square meter. And reflectance is the ratio of light falling on a surface to the light reflected from a surface expressed as a percent. And these things become quite important when we're trying to identify how we can improve uh, the light in a particular space. And I'll, I'll come back to some of these as we go through the presentation. To give you some idea of uh, how these three terms kind of uh, are represented typically in, in describing lighting, we can think of uh, typical illuminance levels or brightness levels, if you like. Outdoors on a noonday summer, summer's day, we might have as many as 160,000 lux. And comparing that to, say, uh, a domestic living room, we see that there's a very significant difference in the illuminance level there, about 50 lux. When we look at the reflectance values of common materials, we see um, high percentages of reflectance from uh, white plaster, from white painted walls. And then we see, obviously, fairly low reflectance from things like uh, gray colors. Wood uh, is not a very good reflector. Obviously, it's going to vary a little bit according to the shades of the wood as well. And then um, the illumination levels and luminances uh, of different um, environments are shown here that with an illuminance of about 150,000 um, lux, uh, looking at a, a newspaper, um, we would get typically a reflectance of about 55%. And that would give us a luminance, so the energy reflected back from that newspaper of about 26,000 candelas per square meter. And there's different uh, examples given here. Um, Again, something to refer back to in more detail. The way we measure light is typically using um, very often a couple of meters. You can use color meters as well. But um, what I would tend to use mainly is the lux meter. 
um, and the luminance meter. So I'm looking at what's reflecting back from things, uh, but, but also looking at the amount of light falling on uh, a particular task or a work area. And you would take measurement actually at the, at the level of the task. So that's going to give you your, your most accurate lux level. Going on to some of the problems of lighting, well, gloomy light, um, it's, a, it's a subjective uh, thing, although you can get broad agreement, uh, you're going to get lots of variation on this as to what people think is gloomy, and it's really, uh, gloomy is really fine by the user as where they find there is insufficient light for the task that they've got to perform. The effect of gloom is that it reduces visual distance and therefore tends to have a postural effect. But it also has a more significant safety effect because when we're working gloomy conditions, um, we can trip over things, we don't see things terribly well, so we can walk into them or um, make contact with um, energized machinery. And one of the big problems of gloomy areas, particularly seen on some farms, is that when you are entering a building, uh, particularly during the daytime, if the building is not well lit inside and you're entering from a, a particularly sunny day, when you walk in, you have that period of time when you just can't see anything around you inside the building. There's a, a kind of temporary blindness uh, while our eyes adapt to the darkness. So um, these are some of the areas that we're going to be looking at. How could we actually eradicate some of these, these hazards on the farm? Kind of opposite of gloom is glare. It's not straight and opposite, but it's, it's really the presence of too much light where we've got uh, too strong a light um, or light that the user perceives as excessively bright. And there's a little bit of distinction here between the way I as an ergonomist um, look at disability glare, which I'll explain in a second, and the way it's, it's otherwise described. But let's go for the general um, disability glare definition, which is where, where a source of elimination um, disables people uh, who have some form of a visual impairment. So that's, that's kind of looking at disability from uh, the point of view of the, uh, the feature of the, of the viewer. But in ergonomics, we tend to use disability glare slightly differently. We say that there is a loss of visual information that, that happens when a very bright light source renders brightly lit ambient surroundings invisible. A good example of this um, is when you're driving at night and somebody, and we usually say some fool, drives towards you with their lights on full beam, momentarily you can be blinded. If you're uh, not quick enough to look away and uh, your eyes, which are dark adapted, now um, catch the, the full focus, those headlight beams, then uh, we can actually be disabled. And what that means is that for a period of time we cannot continue in the task. Uh, which is driving, and the safest thing generally to do is to slow down or pull over until um, you're able to see clearly again. But other sources include unshielded lighting, and very often I do find these on farms, uh, both uh, routes in the farms, but also around the periphery of farms, uh, where these can be a hazard both to users uh, who are employed on the farm and also to people who are just passing by the farm. So unshielded lighting generally is, is something that we really need to be taking more careful account of. Another form of glare is um, specular glare, and the, uh, the common term for this is reflections. Um, now, we can get um, a kind of this indirect glare from just light bouncing off uh, a bit or a shiny surface. Um, but also, there can be situations where, uh, particularly on glazed, um, entranceways, if we're actually wanting to uh, see into the room before we enter it, it, it renders um, that scene inside opaque when we view it from outside. And it's because of the angle of light falling onto the, uh, onto the glass that particularly causes that problem. So specular glare is also something that we need to be conscious of. And it's one of the reasons why when we're doing lighting surveys, we really need to be looking in di at different times of the day in different lighting conditions before deciding whether uh, the lighting is uh, good and safe. Another issue is contrast. And poor contrast is a major problem for, um, for everybody, but particularly for people with visual disorders, as we'll see shortly. 
Contrast is the relationship between the brightness of an object and its background. So that where there is insufficient contrast, it actually becomes hard to distinguish that object from its background. And it's interesting from looking at the National Research Council of Canada's um, uh, scale here, their, their graph, that, that actually just by significantly increase, increasing illuminance, so increasing light levels, that doesn't necessarily compensate terribly well for insufficient contrast. So contrast is something that we need to, we need to take account of. And I've given you here a, a contrast ratio, um, which is luminance of object minus luminance of background divided by the luminance of background. So clearly you're going to need some measuring equipment to be able to decide in some situations whether the contrast is adequate. And we're really aiming for a contrast of, of at least 0 0.5. Another lighting problem is uh, rendered to those who need to see color accurately. And we've all uh, driven down streets at night where you get um, low pressure sodium lighting and kind of all of the uh, cars seem to become monochrome in color. And that's a feature that when we're shining a certain uh, color of lighting onto an object, it actually uh, changes uh, the way the eye perceives that color. And objects can either absorb or reflect certain colors. And the most accurate lighting tends to be the full spectrum lighting. So sunlight's a good example, although sunlight changes in uh, color throughout the day. Um, but let's say uh, at noon, uh, brightly lit, we would tend to find accurate color rendition. And there are other forms, again, which we will cover in this, uh, this webinar of uh, full spectrum lighting. Flicker is something that I come across people complaining regularly about when they're working with fluorescent lamps. And there does seem to be a wide variation in sensitivity to flicker, but people typically perceive flicker, which is a rapidly changing intensity of light, where the, uh, the if you like, the cycle of light change uh, is at least, um, sorry, at the most 50 flashes per second, so that's 50 hertz. And they're most sensitive in this range of 10 to 25 flashes per second. In fact, the sensory system itself can detect flicker rates much higher than that. And uh, these uh, flicker problems are associated with an increased number of complaints of eye strain or headaches. They are possible, uh, it's possible to eliminate them, remove them uh, by using uh, various interventions. Uh, a common one nowadays is to improve the ballast system in the lighting. Certainly, we need to uh, be using um, combinations of lighting as much as we, we can so that we're not constantly just relying on one, one source of lighting. So if it's possible to combine um, fluorescent lighting, for example, indoors in the daytime with some natural daylight, that will tend to reduce the effect of flicker. Maintenance issues mean that we need to be replacing bulbs regularly, and that goes for all bulbs. It, it doesn't mean that something has a maximum life of, say, 20,000 hours, so that we should wait until it dies out before replacing it. And um, with fluorescent lamps, they do tend to flicker more as they get older. So um, replacing the, the ballast with high, efficient, high efficiency electronic ballasts is, is a good idea. And an interesting um, intervention is mixing tubes of different diameters. And that, that kind of, you get a, almost kind of an out of effect uh, where you don't get the, the lights flickering in unison. Uh, so that can work very well too. Shadows, well, strong directional lighting that you see up here in, in a barn uh, can actually create strong shadows. Uh, obviously, they can be problematic. You've got the problem of glare and therefore invisibility of areas in the shadow. Uh, those can be hazards of walking into things, stepping into holes, obviously, we know that in ideal there'll be barriers for things, but uh, but essentially, um, what we're really trying to do is to uh, eliminate those by combining um, directional and diffuse lighting, so that we're rid of strong shadows, we make all areas of the workplace visible, and not forgetting that dynamic shadows can be created, where workers themselves standing in between a light source and the task at hand can create strong shadows. So the location of lighting for a task becomes critical. Think about where the people are going to be when they're actually performing the task. Do they need lighting coming in from a different direction?
Turning to visual performance, uh, there are a couple of main areas, and we're going to cover some additional areas as well, but the, the, uh, the first area that I really want to address is acuity. This is the thing that the optometrist measures by using the Snellen chart, which you see here. And as you look down just above the red line on that chart on the right, you'll see 2020. What that effectively means is that um, most people uh, can read that line um, unaided, so visually unaided, with, um, uh, at a distance of 20 feet. The E at the top would mean that um, uh, most people could read that a distance of 200 feet. So if you can only read that 20 feet, they would say, well, you've got 2200 vision. So acuity is, a, is, is the acuteness or sharpness of our vision, it, the, the ability of our eyes to, and our brain to actually resolve an image in detail. So although 2020 vision is nominal performance, um, we do have some people that actually have better than 2020 vision. I often hear it said, well, I've got 2020 vision as if that's perfection. Well, uh, 2010 vision is twice as good. So um, I don't know how good you need to be. But um, for a particular task, if you do require um, a vision at a particular distance and uh, people are struggling to see um, then one of the things that we can do is, is obviously, goes without saying, uh, they have an eye test. Um, but in addition, if we have poor lighting conditions, then we may find that um, what is normally visible to somebody 2020 may actually not be visible because of poor lighting conditions. Now, acuity is highly dependent on the accommodation of this. And this is the ability of the eye to change the lens shape. So we're using ocular muscles to uh, to make changes to focus the light on a particular part of the eye in, in the retina. Uh, this gives us, if we have normal vision, it gives us a good sharp image. And then we have some problems like myopia, which is nearsightedness, where the visual image focuses ahead of the retina, so in front of it, and farsightedness, where the visual image focuses behind the retina. So these tend to be um, sorted out relatively easily with, um, with corrective eyewear, but there is an age relatedness to us, uh, to this, and anyone who's tried to read uh, text up close as somebody pushes something a foot in front of your face and you're thinking, I can't see it, and we get trombone um, behavior where we're moving things further away so that we can see them. So uh, with age, we do get changes in accommodation. Visual performance also um, in farming, because people typically work around the day, or around, around the clock, and certainly, certainly at this time of the year, we're seeing a lot of people out in the fields uh, working with um, machinery, with illumination, is dark adaptation. Uh, dark adaptation uh, has a couple of aspects to it. Well, the pupil opens, it dilates to admit more light. And then this chemical called visual purple builds up in the retina. The cones, uh, which are responsible for, remember, for color and, and detail, lose sensitivity. And the rods, which are better for peripheral vision and for uh, sensing uh, movement, they tend to predominate. So we actually lose our color discrimination in the dark. And dark adaptation typically takes 30 minutes or more. So when you walk from a very bright environment into a very dark environment, as we see here, the time it takes for you to get used to that can actually be very significant. And during that time, uh, there is certainly a, a risk of uh, accident or injury. By contrast, when you walk back outside, light adaptation only takes a few seconds or a few minutes at most. Something else that declines with age is contrast sensitivity. Um, it results in the reduced capacity to perceive fine detail in a visual object. So, um, when we're designing something, I always say, you know, if you're a 25-year-old designer, um, don't necessarily think that just because you can see what it says that everyone else can. And uh, so we really need to be understanding um, that, uh, particularly in farming, we have um, a significant older workforce. So when we're designing the visual environment and we're, we're creating um, certain types of contrast and illumination, uh, we really need to be taking on of, of the much older uh, performance of, of vision. And none are uh, uh, really more significant than uh, the age-related changes to field of view. Um, 
a very interesting study from Pacific University found that of 900 people aged 52 to 102 years, um, that their, their actual field of view really didn't change very much. It didn't vary very much uh, between those people. But actually, their, their attentional field size decreased dramatically. So that uh, what we find is that for um, older people, um, their capacity for um, seeing and making sense of and reacting to um, something in their field of view becomes very much more limited, very much more focused around the central part of their field of view. And it was interesting that they found that 25% of the oldest age group had no peripheral fields under conditions of divided attention, which simply means that when they were performing a task, a visual task, and something else was happening um, around them uh, that they had to tend to, uh, they really um, lost sight of those things happening around them. This obviously has implications for uh, operating moving machinery um, if uh, there are other people working in the vicinity or if there are other hazards in the vicinity. So just not seeing something is more likely to be a situation for the older worker than for the younger worker. Color blindness is uh, fairly common. Um, it changes um, the sensitivity of the eye to the different uh, parts of the uh, spectrum. And the two most common types are red and green and blue, or yellow, uh, blue and yellow. So people find it hard to distinguish those. And they've got a couple of fancy names, protonopia, uh, which, which shifts uh, the spectrum, uh, the visual spectrum towards 540 nanometers. So that's the green line that we see here. So that's, that's going to give us our, our kind of uh, problems of, of distinguishing a blue-yellow area. And then deuteranopia as well, which shifts in the opposite direction. But one of the things that people with cataracts face is that they, they actually uh, increase their sensitivity uh, to uh, the red end of the spectrum but actually also um, have more difficulty in, in perceiving differences in color towards um, the ends of the spectrum as well. So um, when we're designing for inclusive design, we really need to keep um, these things in mind, actually um, you know, maximize um, our, our use of color in such a way that we're not disabling people who are either older, have color blindness issues, so maybe we could look at redundancy, maybe, maybe we're not just using things with color, but also with different um, uh, shading or with different shapes, and, and, and work in that way so that color blindness doesn't become disabling or dangerous for somebody. Since we're speaking about cataracts, um, what are cataracts? Well, cataracts are, 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 is where a yellow-brown pigment clouds the lens, and um, it obstructs light and Im impairs focusing. It's the most common cause of blindness globally. And the image on the left from lighthouse.org gives a, a pretty good um, representation of, of how this looks. Um, what it gives us is impaired, as we said, impaired color perception. It reduces our con contrast sensitivity, makes driving, reading, recognizing faces problematic, and, and glare becomes particularly um, a, a difficulty for people with cataracts. So the interventions very uh, carefully aiming to eliminate glare, making sure that we have sufficient illumination, and um, again, making sure there's not too much. We'll look at this um, shortly. But also making sure that the task itself is optimized, and that's in terms of contrast and, and just um, uh, putting things into places where they would be expected to be is a, a really good a really step um, when we're, we're starting to understand that the visual environment is not just about dumping more light in there, but it's about the, the design of the whole environment for health and safety. We can adjust window shades to get rid of, of uh, very bright direct sunlight that may be a source of glare. And actually, the type of lighting that we use, um, incandescent lights can cause less glare. They do generate um, more heat. They're maybe not as uh, accurate uh, a color rendition as daylight, daylight fluorescence. As I mentioned before, using bright primary colors with high contrast. And actually, when people with cataracts work outside, they really need to wear sunglasses and a hat. And that's a good idea uh, generally for us anyway in order to uh, reduce the likelihood that we'll have. Another common disorder is macular degeneration. Uh, this is a progressive retinal disease, and it tends to affect older workers, in which the central visual field is destroyed. 
And the kind of lighting that we're looking for here is full spectrum lighting, uh, which is generally considered helpful. Uh, halogen light lamps can be useful. But something also to be aware of is that full spectrum lamps, lamps also uh, produce a, a significant amount of blue light. And if they are excessively um, high intensity on the blue light spectrum, this can actually cause some problems for people with macular degeneration as well. So um, really trying to get some kind of a, a controllability um, over uh, the lighting so that we don't have a strong blue um, uh, light element in, in a where somebody's going to be for a long period of time um, is the way to go here to protect people either from or certainly not so much from, but certainly uh, from, from aggravating their macular degeneration. One of the problems that the lighting designer has, and this is no less true in agricultural settings, is that people tend to like uh, levels of lighting compared with the person working next to them. So we can find tremendous uh, variation in personal preference. Um, however, we do tend to see uh, kind of these general patterns, uh, according to task, of the kind of levels of lighting that most people will find better, uh, including people with visual disorders. So just to, to pick a couple of things out here, um, for example, on a, a, a pill sorting, um, people with cataracts found that medium levels of light, so around 200 lux, were better than dim or bright light. So if it is too bright, um, they had problems with it. Whereas people with macular degeneration or cataracts and macular degeneration didn't so strongly um, identify that as being one being any better than the other. Uh, with reading tasks, uh, brightest uh, is better than dim for people with cataract and medium was better than dim so they really wanted more lighting those were statistically significant and then with cataracts and macular degeneration uh, medium lighting again better than dim but just with a macular degeneration again uh, not statistically different in their capacity for performing the task I mentioned the blue light hazard, and this has been uh, covered by the Manufacturing um, uh, Federation, Selma in particular, has issued a, a paper in, in, in 2011 um, acknowledging the potential for retinal injury due to high energy short wavelength light, by which they mean blue light. Um, at very high intensities, blue light can photochemically cause irreversible damage to retinal cells up to blindness, and children are more sensitive to blue light hazard. People with cataracts um, are actually somewhat protected from it uh, by the yellowing of the lens. And uh, on the other end of the spectrum, uh, the macular degeneration we've already mentioned, the blue light can progress um, the degeneration. And therefore, we really need to be um, trying to find light sources which, which actually don't err on the side of very high levels of blue light. Um, direct near-distance viewing of high-intensity LED light sources is not advisable and uh, really we need to be using LEDs much more carefully and shielding diffusing them. Another problem is glaucoma and this is where there's damage to the optic nerve. It's a progressive um, irreversible uh, form of vision loss and again we need to minimize glare, maximize contrast. Uh, people with glaucoma tend to favor higher levels of illumination um, but for people with glaucoma and cataracts, um, they don't like it quite so bright. So again, really giving people some control over the, uh, the quality and the quantity of light that they use is very, very important wherever possible. Um, so that becomes one of the big take-home messages for today. Give, because of this variation, uh, give people more control. Uh, diabetic retinopathy, in this, the blood vessels in the retina are damaged and leak, and again, minimize glare, focus on contrast, get that really good, and allow people to adjust lighting to their needs. Seasonal affective disorder um, is a depression mainly associated with lower light levels in the winter months, and one of the interventions is um, light therapy, so about 10,000 lux. Uh, in a light box, mimic sunlight. Under the care of a health provider, because there are, not everybody does well this, and, and it, we really need to be monitoring using uh, light therapy. But one study in 2005 found that it was as effective for seasonal affective disorder as using uh, pharmaceuticals. Um, uh, 
light therapy can also alleviate depression. But there are some warnings, so again, this needs to be um, taken under the, um, under the wing, if you like, of, of a qualified health professional. How much light do we need for different tasks? Well, um, again, we're going to get individual variation in what people prefer, but really, um, as kind of guidelines, we can um, put this list here, and we can say, well, look, for example, if we, if we look uh, down to towards the bottom. Um, in fact, this, this bottom one performance of very special visual tasks of extremely low contrast and small size. Um, we would want extremely high levels of, of illumination at the task. Then we go about halfway through, say, a mechanical workshop. Uh, we're looking really around 750 lux at the task um, is really what we're, we're aiming to find. Now, there are, there are various tables around as to uh, levels of lighting we should have, but for all of them we need to be adjusting the way we uh, evaluate that lighting, not just in, in, in simple terms how much light is falling on the task, but also what is the task and who is performing it. So, for example, we need to make some allowances on the previous one for the age of, of uh, the worker. Um, we may need to increase to the next level up um, the lighting for somebody age over 55, but I hasten to add, um, some people may find that excessively bright. So again, as much as possible, give people local control over lighting. The speed or the accuracy where it's critical, again, we uh, need to increase lighting, but where it's um, not important at all, we might be able to reduce lighting levels, to make it a little bit, um, little bit dimmer. Uh, in the work area. And the reflectance of the background is important. So if we've got um, really quite a, a, a highly reflectant, um, reflectance area that we're operating in, then again, we might be able to reduce the actual amount of light falling on uh, the particular work task. The, um, the Illumination Engineering um, Society, which is, is uh, since renamed, but um, they're really looking at uh, minimum illuminance for safety. And, and in terms of lux levels, they're saying that where there's um, a hazard uh, which is uh, in a low activity area and um, uh, really this it's only a slight hazard, um, then a minimum of 5.4 lux which actually is very dim, um, would be required um, for lighting in that area. But these are very much minimums. And um, I, I would um, really be much happier if we're looking at a high hazard um, in a high activity. Uh, I would see 54 lux as really being um, absolutely bottom line and really uh, falling far short of, of what we're probably likely to need for good performance of task. The size of the uh, visual object is important. I'm not going to go through this in too much detail, but um, there are various uh, sources that can tell you how big to make a visual object according to the distance that the opera um, is working from it and, and what the, the lighting levels um, are. So here, um, from Sanders and McCormick, which is a kind of basic ergonomics textbook, textbook um, it has this, this kind of useful information on viewing distances and the size of, of characters um, from, um, with different lighting conditions. So those things can be worth referring back to and are widely available. I mentioned redundancy before and color coding of things is, is great, but you'll notice with these controls they also uh, have other uh, differences between them so they don't uh, cause problems for people who have uh, color blindness. Uh, they have a different shape, a different location, obviously. And, and integrating some of this, this design uh, redundancy um, so that we're not relying on just one aspect of, of sense, um, particularly a visual sense, um, but actually combining different, different senses um, reduces the risk of, of accidental operation or inadvertent use of something. With dynamic displays such as light bars, um, uh, there's been some research which has shown that um, the red signal uh, is most easily picked up than green, yellow, and white. But in the uh, peripheral field of view, so if you locate um, like a light 
paper um, that you're using during uh, plowing or field preparation, if you actually mount that off uh, to the side, then actually using other colors could be um, an improvement. And blue test lights were actually recognized at the greatest distance and with the least number of errors. And, and in fact, it's interesting, the blue, for, because of what we know about the cones and the rods in the eye, that the rods blue um, better in peripheral vision, which we covered before. So actually, you can see blue across a wider visual um, uh, field than you can uh, red. So if you're designing things to attract attention that are um, slightly off um, central vision, then blue is a really good color to choose. OK, these color rules, um, uh, quite simple. You've probably seen these color wheels before. And the idea is that really we need to avoid uh, creating poor contrast situations and, and situations where there are similar levels of brightness in the colors that we're using um, when, when we're trying to uh, maximize the contrast and visibility of an object. So you choose dark colors um, from the uh, lower part of the circle on the left uh, with light colors on the uh, upper circle. And that gives um, this effective contrast that you see with the blue and yellow in the right hand image there. Lighting for safety and performance. Well, we want to try and keep lights on during the day. So we want to equalize lighting doors and outdoors. Um, we don't want big differences between rooms and corridors entering them. So we don't want bright lights in corridors and dark rooms or vice versa. Um, we want to position workers so that um, the source of light is, is behind or to the side of them, but remember that we need to illuminate the tasks if a shadow becomes problematic. Lines or shades should be used to control bright uh, daylight, and we need to illuminate floors to at least 300 lux. Under counter lighting, increase visibility in work areas, and we need work surfaces to be illuminated, as it says here, 500 to 800 lux typically, and higher for precision work but avoiding glare, either direct glare or from reflectance. As task lighting increases, we need to increase ambient room lighting. So don't use a bright lamp in a dark room because that will cause glare and also disability glare. And in pedestrian routes, get rid of glare. So let's, let's minimize the risk of walking into something or walking uh, or falling off something. With vehicles, again, Glare is a big problem. No unshielded lamps. We've got to get rid of, uh, of lamps that shine in, in drivers' faces when they're moving around the farm or close to the farm. We need to be using lighting to highlight uh, hazardous areas. And the, light, the, the color of lighting really needs to be um, suited to the kind of weather conditions that we're likely to, to experience. And make the task more visible as well. Mark the routes using reflective paint or markers. The differences in types of lighting, well, we've obviously got natural light, sun and sunlight, moonlight, not terribly useful most of the time. Uh, sorry, the moonlight's not terribly useful, but the sunlight certainly is. And then um, we can see here in the top two images the differences between incandescent lighting and fluorescent lighting and, and how that changes colors. The low pressure sodium that we see in the middle on the right um, tends to render a monochromatic uh, image. Um, and then, then Increasingly, we're seeing light emitting diodes being used in, in street lighting in, around the world. And Europe is certainly adopting it, and it's starting to be introduced in the United States as well. Um, so actually, using these uh, long life uh, bulbs gives us very good uh, color, um, uh, color uh, rendition. Not all lighting is suitable for uh, rendering color. And what we're aiming for, if you look at the color rendition index in the second, um, uh, the second column of numbers here, uh, we're aiming for something that gives us at least 80 as a, as a CRI, the color rendition index. So you can see that the halogen and incandescent lights tend to be uh, reasonably good. But actually, um, as we would expect, sodium um, struggles, uh, the one at the bottom there really struggles to read the color accurately. Increasingly, we're seeing mixtures of um, daylight and artificial light. And this can work extremely well, very energy efficient. Uh, so here is a, a one before and after the introduction of daylight with, um, with kind of skylight systems. It's very, very useful, um, providing um, particularly transition lighting. So coming out of a barn uh, and into a barn that's, that's lit and, and equalized with the outside area that system can work extremely well. 
lighting of areas, particularly animal areas. There's been some research on this uh, recently that indicates that the uh, more daylight-like uh, types of lighting, particularly LED lighting, um, has some friction benefits. And uh, one of my concerns um, is that if we see a lot of um, uh, LED lighting because it stimulates animal productivity, um, we really need to be aware that we're also creating workspaces for human beings. And um, when um, they're in there just occasionally, it's not really going to be a problem. But if you're working in these spaces for hours on end, then we do need to be at least conscious of the uh, blue light has potential. Lighting can also be um, evaluated by direction. Uh, direct lighting has its uses, um, as we see with a, a metal halide system on the right as a growing lamp, but also one of the problems with direct lighting is that it is a, a frequent source of glare, as in these, these bare um, uh, ceiling luminaires that are fitted into this, this farm workshop. And what we're really aiming for is a direct, uh, indirect mixture where we're at, we've got some light bouncing off surfaces, giving us a kind of general uh, diffuse lighting um, with, with more direct lighting on specific tasks as well. The types of lighting that we're looking at um, with uh, uh, equipment, with machinery, well, again, we need to be maximizing the visibility of tasks, not just inside the cab, but outside the cab. So combinations of lighting becomes important here. But within the cab, we really need to be um, taking care that we're not, we're not actually uh, disabling somebody visually by, by producing bright light sources in a cab that's going to be operated at night. So allowing the dark adaptation means that most of the instrumentation that we use should be illuminated in either red or green. And um, if people are working around us or if there are hazards around us, we obviously need some flood lighting um, as well. And this is quite, quite nicely in the top image where there's, where there's uh, looks like some, some plowing or disking going on. And, and we've got the task lighting, which is very uh, much focused on the, on the task itself at the back. But actually, the flood lighting and the side lighting is giving us good illumination so that nothing unexpected is likely to occur. If you're using LED machines in um, cabs, uh, LED discs, make sure that you can adjust the brightness of them so that they're not excessively um, causing uh, some dis disability glare in nighttime conditions. Information and staff, well, ASAB has lighting for dairy farms in the poultry industry. Um, OSHA sites typically um, uh, practice a practice for uh, industrial lighting. Sorry, there's a, a, mis, a misquote there. It's practice for industrial lighting, R1970. Um, and actually, the latest revision of that, which is um, RP7-1991, um, really sets out minimum standards. Um, it's not always easy to apply these into farming, but, but generally, these are very useful sources of information. Um, you can find information on the, on the OSHA uh, website. And dairy lighting, um, the uh, production aspects of it in Tystall Barns, there is a reference. And a very useful handbook, um, a light um, manual or, or a handbook, which you can find there. You can download it. You can even print it out. It's extremely long, but very detailed and very useful. And there are the resources. So I'm going to hand this back to Paul. Thanks very much for that excellent information, Rob. We'll be uh, doing questions and answers in just a couple minutes. So if you do have uh, more questions, please either enter those through the uh, chat window via text, or again, you are free to use the raise hand icon if you would like to ask a question verbally and you have that capacity through a webcam or microphone. Before we get started on that, I would like to do our four poll questions. The first question just asks for your affiliation in terms of what organization you might be uh, associated with. If you are somehow affiliated with AgriBility, in one way or another, we'd appreciate you designating that choice at the top. If you're not 
affiliated with AgriAbility somehow, then we would like you to choose one of the other choices. And I'll give you a few more seconds. We will broadcast those results so that you can see where everybody is coming from. OK. Thank you very much for your participation on that. Our next question asks about the information that was shared today. If you could let us know if you felt that it was valuable and met your expectations, we would appreciate that. Give you a couple more seconds on that. OK. Thank you for your input. Third question concerns the technology that we use today. If you could let us know if it was usable for you. And also if, for example, you were kicked out of the room, if you were disconnected, if you could let us know that in the chat window also, we would appreciate knowing that so we can communicate that with our information technology staff here at Purdue and try to improve any problems that we had with that. Give you a couple more seconds on that. OK. Thank you for your input. And our final question, based on today's session, would you attend another session in this series? A couple more seconds for you. OK, thank you again for your input. At this point, we'll turn things back over to Rob for questions. Again, if you have questions, please type those in the chat window or raise your hand. We will address you. And after the session is over, I'll have Rob uh, close for us, and then we'll go back to that resource page. Again, the entire PowerPoint will be posted along with the recording of the webinar on our AgriAbility website if you would like to go back and refer to that. Thanks, Paul. That's great. I've got a, a couple of interesting questions, um, which you've probably seen pop up there in the, uh, in the chat. So I'll, I'll cover those in the order they, they came in to me. Um, the first one is, is from um, uh, Michael. Um, thanks for that, Michael. And, and it says that uh, growers are increasingly harvesting lettuce and other produce at night. The work area is usually lit by a bank of floodlights on a pole or a row of floodlights um, on the back of a harvesting machine. Lots of shadows and lighting by distance. Do you have any suggestions for improvements? Um, you know, the, the uh, ideal, of course, is um, for, <laughs> uh, for the work to be illuminated um, maybe from a different um, direction so that the, um, whatever is causing the, um, the shadows in these areas is, is eliminated. One of the simplest ways that I guess you can do this, I mean, I, I'm, I'm uh, I take it that we're actually uh, talking about mechanized um, harvesting. If we're talking about uh, human harvesting, then then one of the simple things that can be done is the use of uh, a body-worn or, or head-worn um, uh, lighting um, units. So lightweight LED units um, uh, you would work extremely well in those kind of situations. They may even improve uh, productivity. I'm not sure there's been any evaluations of that, but that might be one idea. The only way really to um, start to eliminate those shadows just because of the nature of light is simply to provide lighting at, at, at more frequent stages. And that could be uh, some kind, uh, obviously if it's the lighting is only coming from the back of a harvesting machine, then uh, sighting the harvesting machine appropriately so that it's, um, it's casting minimal shadows 
becomes important. Um, and also, so that it's not um, actually uh, producing glare for the workers. Now, I know that's pretty obvious, but, but I would imagine that a lot of people just, uh, you know, will, will go to the most convenient place for the machine um, as it's harvesting going along, rather than thinking about where the lighting is actually directed. So, so this would be a, a kind of very good case for um, really a live field trial of, of you just working with a, a particular grower and saying, you know, is there a way that we can maybe make this more efficient for you by redirecting your lighting, um, whether it's machine mounted or, or uh, strung in from lines. Um, to actually make uh, the task more visible. So between the two things, um, that's that's about the way I would tend to approach it. It would be very much a, a discussion with the um, with the grower along those lines. Other than mounting lighting on um, on the worker themselves, if it's uh, hand harvesting, I'm not sure there's an awful lot else that that can be done. Um, hopefully that's that's useful for that. Uh, the second question is is uh, from uh, Dr. Regioni, I hope I'm pronouncing that right. Um, here we have a lot of rural roads and accidents and fog is persistent during the winter. Is there a thing that can help the farmers to drive better and more safely with these conditions? Well, I mentioned um, a few of the, the ideas for this. Um, uh, obviously, with rural roads, really, what th there's probably not an awful lot that's going to be spent on, on kind of more clearly defining uh, the roadway. Um, such as reflective markings and, and, and edge markings and hazards being marked with reflective uh, markers or paint. But that might be um, one way if there is a, particular, a particularly dangerous area that things could be improved. Um, the use of um, sodium lighting in these areas um, does help to make things more visible in fog. Um, uh, training uh, people um, on um, how to adjust their lighting, so keeping uh, lighting dipped, obviously slowing down um, is a behavioral change that people need to make. It's not always easy to get farmers who are extremely busy and time pressed um, to slow down or other drivers, in fact. They may not, may not be the farmers that are causing the problems at all. The type of lighting that they fit to their vehicles and the type of markers that they fit to their vehicles uh, can be optimized for, for fog. So um, uh, the color of lighting, so having a, a yellow cast lighting, these used to be very, very popular um, in rally driving, for example, which I, I used to be a big fan of. And um, for, for foggy conditions, they all used um, a yellow cast of light because you didn't get the bright glare, but it still uh, kind of, it almost felt like it cuts through the fog. So, so that, that kind of sodium approach works very well there. But also marking uh, the vehicles, the farm vehicles themselves, uh, illuminating them uh, to alert other drivers that they are there as far away as possible. So having good, um, clean illumination uh, or reflect, uh, reflecting systems on them is critical to safety. Slowing down, obviously, it goes without saying. Um, and then marking the road differently. Those are about the only things that I can uh, really think that would help. Um, farm workers are working at night more and more to harvest crops at their peak. Um, peak freshness often in close proximity to trucks, tractors, and other moving equipment. Well, I did uh, mention, and uh, th thanks, Joel. This is from Joel Foss, and uh, I did mention the uh, one of the problems is that we we don't just want spotlighting. Um, we we do need to combine lighting the same as we're looking at ambient lighting um, being mixed with task lighting. We should adopt similar approaches when we're working outside in dark conditions. We need to have a visibility of the general work area so that the peripheral vision can pick those people up. Um, we also need to be protecting those workers by putting them into highly visible clothing. So having a bunch of people working in grays and browns uh, is not terribly helpful. So uh, putting uh, protective gear on those so that they're much more likely to be picked up. Now, if you've got a lot of nighttime working, we can obviously work with the, the sort of the greens. And, and then also, as we mentioned, even some of the, um, the uh, fluorescent blues um, that are out there as, as warnings. So flood lighting, task lighting, and making the workers themselves more visible, that's how I would um, approach solving that problem. OK. Um, 
I just uh, got one final one, which I think I've just got time for from Rick in Wyoming. Uh, there are some bright blue lights that are occasionally seen on car headlights that are annoying. I know what you mean and distracting to look at from oncoming cars. What kind are those? And are those something that will become more common cars and other lighting? You know, um, you know I th I, I'm not an expert on what those lights are. It's relatively a rarity around here in Indiana. I see a few of them. Um, yes, they do, uh, because what we said about the rods, they, uh, we do pick them up very, very clearly. Um, I guess there's not an awful lot we can do about them um, unless they're going to be regulated as being a distraction, and, and I'm not sure that there's any evidence that they are more likely to cause um, road accidents, so I'm not sure that's ever going to happen. Um, but I, th I think that uh, they may be a form of tungsten lighting, um, you know, they, they could be some form of, of uh, halogen lighting. I'm, I'm really not an expert on, on uh, car lighting. But uh, I do think um, that they tend to be um, in some, I've noticed in some of the more high-end vehicles, there may well be uh, visual advantages to using them, so they, uh, they may prove to be uh, more commonly used in the future. And, um, I'm afraid it, it's just not necessarily going to be great for um, for those who have to face them head on. It's uh, just one of those things. I'm going to um, hand over to uh, to Paul now um, just to close things off. Rob, we just have one more question if you'd like to uh, come back and address that. Okay, it looks like we've lost Rob for that last question. Um, so we will, uh, again, archive this on our website, uh, both as you see it on your screen right now and in the chat window, it's available at the top also. And uh, as we close, I will go ahead and uh, refer you back to the reference slide that was the last in the presentation. So again, we thank you for your participation today. Our next webinar is uh, tentatively scheduled for the end of July, and our subject for that is the 211 network, which uh, many of you may be familiar with, but it's the information referral system that's available in most of the communities around the country, and we'll be talking about how uh, you can get information through that and how you can make information about your organization accessible to that network so that others can uh, find you through 211. So again, thank you and uh, have a good day.